Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. I'm Dan Bigman, the editor of Chief Executive Magazine and Corporate Board Member Magazine. From social unrest to COVID-19 to digital technology, business leaders are facing a period of change and disruption, and like any other in a century or more, when the calls on all of us to rethink the way we operate and how we lead our organizations. Blistering economic volatility, deep uncertainty about the future, and ferocious rates of change have left workers, customers, and management teams hungry for leadership that is more empathetic, more open, and more engaged with hearts as well as minds. Leading through this transformative time requires more than a steady hand and mastery of strategic thinking. It demands a higher level of emotional intelligence. So today, we're pleased to partner with Alex Partners, a world-renowned leader in corporate turnarounds, restructurings, and leadership development for more than 40 years, to share with you a new way of developing as a transformative leader by building your personal EQ and effectively marrying it to strategic planning, communications, decision-making, and other vital leadership functions. For this conversation, we're really thankful to have two of Alex Partners' most experienced leaders, Ted Balilis, Managing Director, Chief Talent Officer, and Eric Koza, Managing Director and Turnaround and Restructuring and New York mo Local Market Leader. Ted is an expert on the psychology of leadership and its impact during periods of severe business and societal disruption, and he leads the firm's transformative leadership practice. His career spans three decades as a psychologist, human resources executive, management consultant, and executive coach. He launched the first commercial practice in leadership and human capital at Alex Partners, which advises investors, CEOs, and boards on the selection and development of leaders and the alignment of culture for maximum and sustainable value creation. Eric specializes in providing leadership to troubled and underperforming companies and advising senior executives, boards of directors, and creditors. He has more than 20 years of experience serving in a variety of roles, including in senior management positions as a financial advisor, a principal investor, and a director of public and private companies. He was recently chief restructuring officer of Avaya, which was named Turnaround Management Association's 2018 Transaction of the Year. Before we begin, some housekeeping notes. I'll be back at the end to facilitate Q&A, so please send your questions in throughout the presentation using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. If you have technical issues, we're happy to help you out, but please submit them through the chat function, which is also located at the bottom of your screen. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Ted and Eric. Thank you, Dan. Uh, it's Eric Koza. Good afternoon, everyone, and pleased to be here virtually with you. Um, I'm gonna kick the discussion off with a few insights uh, related to a few things. One, uh, the existing macroeconomic um, environment, how it's different, um, and really where we have seen examples of leadership success uh, in crisis. And I'd like to start with slide four. Um, I think it's important to step back and start by making a few observations. And we at Alex Partners see the driving forces of the economy changing, really all pre-COVID-19. And if you look at the slide where we have the traditional credit, credit cycle curve, elongated, gradual, boom and bust driven by credit expansion and, and credit contraction, and this cycle has historically really driven the success of business and the economy at large, What's different today is that we see disruption as the primary economic driver. It's really due to a variety of factors, um, technological shifts, environmental awareness, societal changes, regulatory considerations, to mention a few. And I think these forces have effectively replaced more traditional cycles as the main driver of economic outcomes. And with a pace that's accelerating and the impact magnified. I think the distinction here is that the disruption cycle curve, as we call it, is shorter and more sudden than traditional economic cycles. And listen, you might ask, why, why is this important? Um, it's important because in our view, even pre-COVID-19, we were in the midst of significant change. Um, I'd like to turn to slide five. Uh, today, disruption is across a variety of industries and it's happening more frequently and with overlapping and, and additive impact. And this causes really dislocation on a number of fronts, um, whether it's shareholder value, revenue, profits, jobs, and now we layer in you know, a global pandemic. 
And as you can see in the slide, you know, we circle public health and, and public health has really transitioned from a disruptive factor, one of many, as you see in the slide, to really the disruptive factor uh, as, as you think about things today. And the resulting effect is a rate of change in business operations that, that's truly unlike anything we've ever witnessed. And essentially overnight and with very little visibility, an unprecedented operating environment. And where we believe you know, the need for leadership becomes ever more critical. And we understand that the stakes are very high. You know, for some companies, it's about survival. I'm in the turnaround and restructuring practice. And for others, it, it's about adapting and, and developing new operating models for the future. And it's really, really important to get this right. Turning to slide six. Um, so what are we seeing? What are we seeing in Alex Partners uh, with our clients in the industry? Um, you know, generally speaking, most industries and companies are, are really experiencing a confluence of events. Um, rapid changes in demand, um, you know, few are up and, and, and most are down at this point in time. Um, supply chain disruption, liquidity shortfalls, and employee fear and, and employee uncertainty. And despite, you know, trillions of dollars of, of government aid worldwide, and possibly more to come as we read in the paper and the new, news articles every day, uh, no one really knows what the future is at this point. V-shape, U-shape, L-shape recovery, you know, whatever letter you want to pick, it's, it's very likely going to be wrong. Um, so, you know, from our perspective, we believe leadership behavior is one of, if not the most critical components to responding to the change that we see today, and quite frankly, the challenge. Um, I'm sure many of you have experienced on the phone uh, in, in this, in this uh, virtual room, you know, some very difficult decisions to date with respect to your business or observed other businesses. Um, whether it's plant or facility closures, furloughs, pay reductions, spending cuts, order cancellations, really thinking through operating model changes or, you know, financing to shore up your balance sheet. Um, and we've seen many companies, you know, execute very successfully to date and others have, others have stumbled. Um, and I think where we've seen success, leaders have demonstrated empathy, speed to action, decisiveness and agility. And, and very importantly, it's, it's been a continuous communication with the employee base and its various key stakeholders. Um, you know, many, ex many executives are, are really rethinking how they do business from a traditional business model standpoint. Um, as it may not be appropriate today and things are developing in the future. Um, and some examples of that that we're seeing uh, and involved with are things such as new ways of selling, uh, acceleration of digital plans or virtual selling models, um, new ways of delivering goods or distribution, contactless delivery or pay uh, with potential speed improvement benefits. New ways of working, as we're all seeing, you know, in, in our own jobs and in various jobs, hybrid work models that really have opportunities such as consolidation of office or facility space, reduction in travel, not to mention, you know, potential Im improved employee flexibility and morale in many cases. New ways of communicating, um, such as this, uh, this, this seminar here, Microsoft Teams, Zoom, and with added frequency uh, and employee and customer interaction and, and behavior. And new ways of protecting our employees and, and their health and wel welfare. Um, you know, on the other hand, you know, some companies have been more challenged and, and, and when complicated by things such as, you know, a lack of clear direction and messaging, um, not being quick to adapt or being paralyzed in information, um, have not been focused on their people uh, or not anticipating their end customer needs and, and how that might be changing. Now, cl clearly, um, there is no one size fits all approach. So, you know, we understand certain industries and companies are, are being impacted more severely than others. So please keep that in mind as, as I talk through some examples. Um, however, you know, many successful leaders have found ways to transform in the face of adversity, but it hinges on the ability to interact effectively to communicate and relate with other people. And in particular, in times of trouble, 
as I see day in and day out in the turnaround restructuring practice, the ability to read the room has become ever more critical. And ultimately, I think, you know, people want to be led. They want clear direction. They want a clear path forward. And interestingly, you know, everyone remembers a leader in crisis. It's an opportunity for you or somebody at the helm, you know, to really take hold and affect change and, 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 and do that when it really matters. And with that, you know, I'll turn it over to my partner, Ted, who will dive into more detail. Thanks, Eric, and, uh, and thank you, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be able to join you today. And many of the things that Eric has touched on, I'm gonna to try to elaborate on a little bit and talk about the high EQ, the high emotionally intelligent leader, along with something that we call transformative leadership. Emotional intelligence is the ability to understand and manage your own emotions while recognizing and influencing the emotions and relationships of those around you. So Eric just mentioned reading the room, being to connect, being able to connect with hearts and minds. Emotional intelligence is essential to good leadership now more than ever because it helps leaders capture hearts and minds. And hopefully over the next few minutes, I'll make that case to you. Emotional intelligence and transformative leadership is crucial at this time because of the disruptive, unprecedented disruptive uh, situations that we're seeing. We need to lead, we need to inspire, we need to motivate others. And EQ allows us to connect deeply with our colleagues, with our employees, with clients, and with our teams. I also think that leadership itself is transforming as a result of this unprecedented disruption. So we're familiar with traditional models of leadership, um, we've lived through decades of those. I think the transformative model of leadership, which I'll explain in a little bit, is really the model for the future. First, let's dig in a little bit and make sure we all are on the same page about what emotional intelligence is. Sometimes people equate emotional intelligence with the ability to have empathy, which is quite important, but it's not just that. Uh, the concept of emotional intelligence has been studied for over 30 years. There are actually five categories, five factors in emotional intelligence, as you can see in the screen. One is self-awareness, the ability to recognize your own moods and your own emotional states, and then really importantly, the ability to recognize the impact those emotional states are having on other people. Self-regulation, what do you do with your own emotions? What do you do when, you're, when you feel like being sarcastic or brusque or irritable? How do you behaviorally manage the way that you feel? Motivation is a huge component of emotional intelligence. Knowing what you're motivated by and knowing how other people see your motivation. Do they see you as motivated by power and status and money? Do they see you motivated by purpose, by values? We learned from Aristotle that humans are meaning seeking meaning-making beings. And we learn from Freud that there are two big areas of life, work and love. So in the work arena, CEO leadership in particular and emotional intelligence plays a huge role in creating meaning at work, at connecting why we're doing what we're doing and how that has impact on the business, on our, on our customers, on our clients, on society at large. Millennials and other generations want to work for companies where the, lead, where the leader's motivation is clear and it's noble. It serves a higher purpose. Empathy, of course, is, is the, the crown jewel in the concept of emotional intelligence. We actually talk about three different kinds of empathy. We talk about cognitive empathy, emotional empathy, and compassionate empathy. So it's really, can I, can I literally put myself in the position of the other person? Can I walk in her shoes? Do I know what it's like to be working from home right now with all of the other things that are going on? Can I feel what that person is feeling? And can I take the steps, compassionate empathy, to do something about it? As, as Eric mentioned before, can I communicate this to other people so that they know I feel the way that they feel? And then social skill. What do I do with people, reading a room, how do I manage relationships? How do I build trust, find common ground, 
be able to reach out to people that may be very, very upset in the light of the severe disruption we're, we're going through. There have been dozens and dozens of studies on emotional intelligence, on transformative leadership, and, and some of the results might surprise you. People high in EQ have much higher job satisfaction, and the people that work for them have higher job satisfaction. From a job performance standpoint, whether you're a CEO, a senior executive, a sales professional, a physician, a teacher, individuals with high EQ perform better at work. It's negatively correlated with job burnout. In other words, people who are high in EQ are more stress hardy. They're, they're better able to lead through disruption. They're better able to connect with their people, to give them hope, to talk about the values of the organization and where the company is headed. That, lead, that critical leadership function that Eric talked about a few minutes ago. We're living in a world where diversity and inclusion and the creation of cultures of diversity and, and inclusion are paramount for attracting, retaining, and developing talent, among other things. No surprise, high EQ leaders really excel in creating cultures like that. Next slide, please, uh, Rachel. Let, let's take the, the business question right off the table immediately. Um, you don't need to pursue high emotional intelligence at the expense of hardcore business results. Studies after studies show that whatever output variable you wanna select, uh, total return to shareholders or some form of employee engagement, low EQ leaders are not as good performers in terms of business results as high EQ leaders. Next slide, please. Now, a couple of years ago, there was a very large study across some major companies, Volvo, IBM, Pepsi, and American Express, studying the effectiveness of, of senior executives and looking at their cognitive abilities, looking at their IQ, looking at their emotional intelligence. And close to 90%, 90% of their success as executives across these companies were attributable to emotional intelligence. Next slide, please. I wanna talk a little bit more about leadership writ large. So the transformative leadership model is a model that we think is purpose built for leading through periods of disruption and for supporting the sustainability of change. So these five dimensions, and you'll see that strong EQ is one of five, but it is just one of five. We believe that this is a, the leader of the future. We believe that this transformative leader is best suited to the kinds of times we're living through now and into the future. Someone who can create a compelling and inspiring vision, who sets a strong personal example. More and more and more, we're looking to our leaders for authenticity, for ethics, for unquestionable integrity. We want to know their values. We want to know what they care about. What I said a little bit earlier about what are their motives. The transformative leader can articulate the values and purpose of an organization. The why question, why am I in this job? Why am I working for this company? Why should I stay at this company and not go to another one? The strong EQ piece is there, of course. And the fifth, um, the fifth factor in the transformative leadership model is, is the one around the commitment to learning and development. Always be learning, always be developing. There are a number of CEOs, I think, that have shown us um, positively what EQ and transformative leadership really look like. I heard Mary Barra of General Motors last week on a podcast say that when people feel like they can bring their whole self to work, they bring their best self to work. Now, that's an extraordinary thing for a leader to say. It's also an extraordinary thing for a company and a culture to be created so that people can bring their best selves and their whole selves to work. In the future, organizations that are able to handle disruption and that are sustainable through disruption need leaders like that. Many of us on this call, I'm sure back in March, saw the video of Arnie Sorensen of Marriott when he had to furlough and lay off tens of thousands of employees. That was one authentic, presentation. He was emotional, appropriately so. 
He showed his values. He showed his caring. Lots of examples. Um, Bill McDermott, the CEO of Service Master, describes himself as hungry, humble, purpose-driven, people-led, doing the right thing. Um, Mark Benioff of, of Salesforce, imploring his fellow CEOs to be transparent and compassionate in the actions that they take. Um, Dan, you mentioned it earlier this week, Mike uh, Kaufman, the CEO of Cardinal Health, before the tragic death of George Floyd, Mike took his senior executive team to the new National Museum for Peace and Justice. So we're seeing more and more and more CEOs stepping out of the traditional leadership role and sharing more of their personal values, stepping up, stepping in to what their people want and need out of them. Next slide, please. I just wanna quickly mention this example from the military. So emotional intelligence and special forces, some of you may know this, um, EQ is really the secret weapon, particularly with, with groups like the Green Berets, where they have to go into a foreign country and they need to be the teachers, the coaches, the mentors to foreign native militaries. Talk about reading a room. They have to read the culture. They have to build trust and rapport. They have to relate to people very different than themselves. So I'm going to toss this, I think, Dan, to you in a, in a second, but, but kind of just wrapping up this section, emotional intelligence, absolutely critical for leading through times of disruption. The transformative leadership model, which embraces emotional intelligence, we think is the, mo is the leadership model of the future and the most robust model where leaders can be authentic, show respect, show empathy. People are hurting and they need to feel that their leaders care. Dan, back to you. Ted, thank you very much. And uh, Eric, thank you. We have deliberately uh, left a lot of time here because we, we got a lot of questions ahead of time and we're gonna get a lot of questions during this. So please, if you do have questions, beat the rush, put them in through the Q&A right now uh, and we'll get to some straight away here. Ted, first up for you, why is EQ so important to master, especially right now? Why is this the time to get it right? Talk a little bit in, about the nuts and bolts of it. Why does it lead, lend itself to these moments of great disruption and great uh, change? I, I, think, um, I think Dan, Mary Barra of General Motors said it best about bringing the whole self to work, work bringing the best self to work. People are hurting, people are worried, people are scared. Um, they may, you know, they may be smiling on camera, but they're probably not smiling, at least not smiling all the time off camera. And leaders need to understand, they need to empathize, they need to do something with that empathy. In other words, in times of intense disruption, people need to know that their leaders care. And, and the flip side of that is if, if leaders aren't able to communicate, if they're not able to share that kind of caring, they're not gonna retain their talent. We'll make it through this crisis. We'll make it through these disruptions. And I think, I think it was you, said, you or Eric said at the very, very beginning, people remember how leaders show up in a crisis. And if you don't show up very well, you may, you may find the effects of that many months later in terms of your people. So help us out growing our EQ. Uh, you know, I'm sure none of us are where we want to be on this. Uh, what are some tips you can give us about becoming a higher EQ leader and growing into, you know, more holistically what you've talked about as the transformative leader? How do we get there? Um, great. I'll try to go kind of quickly through. I actually created a slide, Rachel, if you can, if you can put that up. And I tried to map those five categories of emotional intelligence. So in terms of self-awareness, absolutely critical. Um, you've got to understand both how you're feeling and, and your, your motives and your mood states and their impact on other people, particularly when you're under stress. So you need to get feedback, plain and simple. If you haven't done a good quality 360 degree feedback exercise, you need to do that. We really, really like 
this online tool that we use that's normative based. So not only am I getting feedback from all the usual sources, I'm able to compare my ratings with a norm group. It's extremely important. So engage, you know, work with a coach, work with someone, have a 360, have an informal 360, have honest conversations with people who care about you so that you understand your strengths and your weaknesses, particularly under stress. In terms of then, what do you do with your stress as a leader? You know, the daily meditation, stress reduction techniques, physical exercise, time management, mindfulness is extremely helpful to calm us down, center us, because we're human beings too. Leaders are human beings too. And if you can't manage yourself, you're never gonna be able to manage other people. Um, in terms of motivation, persevere, understand, are you, an, are you an optimist or a pessimist? Get, again, get feedback on how you're managing your own motivation. And get an understanding of how empathic you are. Ask people, listen, work on those listening skills. Mm. Spend more time listening than talking. And get, get yourself a coach. You know, I would say that more than half of the executive coaching that we do is on some form of building up emotional intelligence in, in, uh, in leaders. And Eric, you spend your life in the middle of some really hairy situations trying to unsnarl things uh, with companies. Talk to us a little bit from a boots on the ground perspective about characteristics you've seen in successful transformative leaders. What, what, you know, what works, what kind of behaviors do you see sometimes, not naming names, that don't benefit the situation um, and, uh, and result in uh, adverse reactions? Yeah, I, I think there are, there are really a, a few that are very important. I think, you know, one is, you know, strong communication. Um, in terms of characteristics, um, well-defined messages, uh, you know, a path forward. And, and I think Ted said it well earlier, which is there needs to be purpose. And I think the more that there's purpose, there's more of, of, of meeting for some people. Um, you know, focusing on the people first approach, as Ted and I described in the slides earlier. And, and by this, I mean, you know, with respect to your employees and with respect to all the um, particularly in a, a project or a turnaround or, or transformation, you know, people want to know what their role is, playing a, a critical role. Why is this important? And not only for the bigger purpose, but why is it, why am I important? Why am I an important part of, of of pulling on this rope to achieve whatever success is and however that's defined. And in many situations, particularly in turnaround and crisis, um, I think the key attribute is, is really adapting and speed and decision making. Um, you know, many times situations that I'm in and I'm sure situations that you know, in the seminar are involved with are just don't have perfect information in the time of unprecedented you know, operating environments, you know, the 80-20 rule comes into play. It can't be, I think, to your point, it can't be you know, non-movement, and, and that means that you're not achieving whatever goal you have to achieve. So you need to make decisions in the many instances. What I think about the areas is communication, purpose, focus on people, and, you know, speed to action decision-making or Certainly, critical piece of that um, attributes of the business in contract. And Eric, we're having a little bit of trouble hearing you. The audio is a little bit garbled. Um, you know, we're all still figuring some of this technology out, even months into the pandemic. So um, maybe we could uh, just try being a little closer, or hopefully, just the the internet gods will will shine on us, and uh, the the audio will ungarble a little. Um, I'll throw another question out to Ted. These are all great things, developing your EQ. How do you develop a team's EQ? How do you make it more of a, take it from being the part the leader to getting these behaviors to be um, more disseminated through your, through your leadership team and down? That's a great question. It's actually, it can actually be quite fun and, and uh, very um, coalescing for a team to go through an exercise like this together. So, 
let's say you're, you know, you're, you're the CEO and you've got six or seven or eight, you know, key people go through that 360 degree feedback together, get your private, your individual uh, feedback, but then come together usually with a facilitator and then share one or two new things that you learned through that. Or, you know, there are things, you know, there, there are ways of looking at what are the group needs. Maybe the group needs to work on listening skills. Maybe the group needs to understand how to relate to the millennial generation better. Whatever the themes are, but go through those themes as a class. Um, you can make it fun. You can make it a, obviously a very uh, intensive learning environment. But I would actually recommend to work together in that way. If you're working alone or you're working individually with a coach, be willing to share what you're working on. I call it the paradox of leadership. It's we, we think that, you know, um, there's still that kind of hidden expectation that we should know all of these things. When people know that you're asking honest questions, that you're working with someone, that you're trying to develop, whether it's your listening skills, your ability to control your stress, they're going to help you out. They're going to find ways of helping you out. And there's a, it's a great way to, to build your own credibility in your organization. So I've worked with, you know, more than a few um, CEOs who kind of take their various you know, reports of various kinds and kind of wave them in front of the team saying, look, I'm committed to being the best leader that I can be. I want all of you to be as well. And Eric, talk to us a little bit about adapting. These, these are not, I imagine, this does not just apply to big companies, right? These are, this is for small, medium enterprises. This is for, for companies of all sizes. How do you, you know, talk a little bit about these uh, techniques and approaches that we're talking about for all different size organizations that you deal with? Yeah, and I think T Ted's added quite a bit of color there as well. But, you know, I, I think, you know, this is applicable no matter how big, no matter how small, uh, simpler, complex, you know, these are leadership insights like, described by Ted and, and, and those that, you know, we see day in, day out. And all of these observations are applicable, you know, for companies of all size and quite frankly, probably for many, many facets of life. So, you know, I think these lessons, learnings, frameworks, as, as, as Ted uh, discussed, you know, are very applicable, you know, across any size organization. And Talk a little, uh, if we could step back here just for one sec. One of the big questions everybody has right now is where are we going? Obviously, nobody knows if it's the V, the U, the L, the, the, the Nike symbol, the inverted, whatever. I, it feels like we're doing technical analysis in the stock market suddenly. Uh, where's a good way to look for a crystal ball to forecast about the economy? How do you find the right sources and where do you look for good advice? You know, it's, it's, it's interesting. Good question. Um, I don't think anyone has a perfect crystal ball here. Um, no matter who it is, they're probably going to be wrong, um, as I described. And, and I think, you know, what, what, what we believe this does is it really reinforces the, the need for, you know, companies to be evaluating a variety of scenarios. Um, for, for example, for those with solid liquidity, you know, healthy balance sheet, a positive views of long-term success, it's an interesting time to be opportunistic in investing growth. Um, for those companies that are not as well positioned or impacted you know, more severely in this pandemic, um, really ensuring that you have, you know, adequate liquidity runway. You want to see yourself to the other side. Of it. So, you know, in, in, in our world and our practice, you know, it, it breaks down into two pretty fundamental items as we think about um, business. You know, let's focus on the things that we can control um, because those are in our hands and, and we can help drive the ship, so to speak, and really plan for those things that we can. And this is about making sure that, you know, um, with the global pandemic and, you know, a, you know, another, you know, downturn as a result of that, you know, are we planning for that and are we getting in front of that? So focus on those things that we can control to really and for those things we can so that we're, you know, at least best positioning, you know, whatever that outcome or whatever the market environment looks like, you know, six months, 12 months, eight months down the road. And Ted, um, part of doing all of this is obviously part of leadership is triage. Um, where are you going to focus in any given time, any given day? There's a lot of conversation around stakeholder capitalism these days. Talk, talk a little bit about who, 
about the priority list uh, in times of crisis, shareholders and stakeholders, why, how, what, what's, what's your thinking around all of that? Well, I think the first phrase that comes to mind, Dan, is it's a balancing act, right? We're all familiar with the business roundtable from last year. <coughs> the, apparently the movement, you know, from shareholders to broadening the stakeholders. I mean, what needs to happen ideally is, is, is both, right? There's, there's been a shift over the years, but both are equally important for different reasons. Um, stakeholders, especially employees, suppliers, and vendors, you know, are creating, are essentially the engine creating the value for shareholders. And I think that what CEOs and boards really need to pay attention to is how, how can you do both? It's not an either and equation. And that's, that's something we're all getting uh, a lesson in and we have to do better in. And I will say, it seems a lot of private companies, this hasn't even been an issue for a very long time that they, they're not dealing with public markets. They do have to do this balancing act. They go to the same little league games as their employees. So some of this is not new, probably for a lot of the members of the audience that we have here. Um, Eric, when it, right now there's, you know, there's a lot of uh, societal unrest, economic, there's just so much attention being drawn to the things that are disruptive externally, but employees, you know, they're, they're struggling with all of that stuff, plus the other stuff that they normally have in terms of career advancement and wanting to make VP and all of the usual things that we have in businesses. Talk a little bit about strategies that can be utilized by leaders at all levels to kind of, you know, beef up morale, keep, you know, keep things going for people, um, you know, that, that make the individual worker feel like they're still valued that there still is a future out there for them? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a great question. And um, I, I, these aren't, you know, I, I think some of the tactics that we've seen work and certainly those that, that we, you know, employ within our, our own organization um, are pretty, I think, simple, but are necessary, which are, you know, getting back to the communication and interaction. I think, you know, given this hybrid work environment or, or remote work environment rather, um, you know, having more frequent touch points, um, being open about um, how we're dealing with and helping, you know, our employees and their health and welfare. Um, that open communication, I think, becomes, you know, extremely critical so people know, you know, what are the plans? How are you thinking about me? Um, and, and how are you making sure that, you know, I as an employee am, am comfortable and, and, and safe? Um, and I think along those same lines, you know, it's an opportunity to have multiple touch points and interaction about, you know, what does the world look like, you know, six months, a month? Yep. And, you know, what is your role and how are you going to play a part in that role? So I think frequency of interaction um, and, and, and communication are, are critical. Really being open with the employee base um, to make sure that they understand the role they play and the path they're on. Um, and it just becomes more important given this, you know, remote work environment. I'm going to go to some of the questions we got even before we did this today, and then I'll turn to some of the live questions as well. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, the, what do you call it? Ted, you, you, you talked a little bit about some of the business impact ROI for, uh, for more high EQ leaders versus uh, less so. Um, I guess that's an odd way to phrase it, but why, why is that the case? Um, Talk a little bit about some of those studies and why you think there is such a direct connection between the performance and the higher IQ. I think there's, it's a great question. I think it's a multi, multi-sided kind of question. Let's just take the topic of talent, for example. A players, the very, very best people, the best performers want to work for an organization where the CEO, where the leader is, it's more than just about profits right? It's, it's, it's not, it, there's purpose, not just profits. And that purpose has to be articulated. It has to be communicated. It has to be reflective, most importantly, in the behavior of the organization. Um, I, to just piggybacking a bit on, on Eric's answer a moment ago, you know, crises are a terrific time to promote people. They're a terrific time to find those high potentials, that junior talent. And 
bump them up, maybe even double bump them up. So high performers see that and they, they want to work for organizations like that. So your question is why are, they, why are, why are high EQ led organizations, why are they better performers? Because they take better care of their talent, number one. Then they become talent magnets. People want to go there. When Eric is confronted with a situation, one of the first things he thinks about is, I'm sure, how many people are going to leave? How many people are going to jump ship? There are going to be fewer people leaving, I would, I would believe, depending on that stronger leadership, that, that, that healthier, more holistic leader who then is able to communicate, you know, what are our values? We're not going to compromise our values. These are very, very tough times. We're going to have to make the following changes, but we're going to stay true to our values. Contrast that to another organization I won't mention, but who let, who let a well-known organization that let off their employees via video. Um, you know, not only is that ethically wrong, I think they're going to have a very hard time restarting. Yep. You can't take that back and that's going to follow them around. Eric, can you talk to us a little bit? Someone had a question here. Um, how do emotionally plugged in leaders enforce rules in times of hyper rethink? For example, wearing masks or not wearing masks, um, keeping distance, not keeping distance. You know, what are some of the, you know, the ways that, uh, someone who gets people a little bit better will have an advantage there uh, than, than not. I, I, I think if you, if you start with, you know, thinking about the health and welfare of your people, I think it's easy to describe and, and to articulate why something is important. For example, you're using your, using your example of wearing a mask. You know, maybe some people don't want to because it's, they don't believe it's appropriate, but clearly it's important. It's important not only for that employee, but the other employees, um, ensuring that everyone's health and welfare is, is, is not at risk. And I think if it's articulated the right way, and, and that's more earlier, if people understand that this is somebody who, you know, is doing this for a broader, they're more likely to listen and talk um, using your experience. And that, that leaves me a question, Ted. We've talked a lot about the transformative leader model. Contrast that with what we haven't talked about, which is the other models that we've seen along the way. Um, you know, what are some of the other models out there for leadership and why do they tend to get stumble in times like this? Like well, command and control folks. Yeah, just, just two. One would be, the, or, or maybe three. So, so the transactional model of leadership, right? I pay you, I pay you to do a job, do, a, do, do the job. I don't think that requires a lot of explanation in terms of <laughs> why that's limiting. Hey, hey, it works for some people. It works for some people. It doesn't work for most people. The heroic model, which we've seen a lot in, uh, we've seen it in the private equity world over the last few decades, kind of one person is the founder and everything kind of hinges on, on that founder. Well, that's a, that gets crowded really, really um, quickly when there are ambitious people that want to, Come up, uh, come up the ladder. So the transactional model, the, the the heroic model, or the founder-led model. You know what we haven't really touched upon here, which would answer your question, I think, best, Dan, is the notion of culture. And mm -hmm. we talk all the time about leadership and culture are two sides of the same coin. So that's why we have the phrase culture carriers. So leaders who are who are literally carrying the culture have to ask themselves, well, what am I communicating to the people that work here? Am I communicating, as Eric was pointing out before, that, that we all care about each other and wherever you may fall on the mask question, you need to think about the good of everybody, right? Or is it more that transactional model of leadership, which is, you know, I got mine, you got yours, I paid you, now, you know, get back to work. Are you treating people as units of output or are you treating people as Mary Barra said of, in terms of their whole self? That's, that's the critical, I think, juncture we're at in leadership today. And talk a little bit more. I, I find the culture carrier idea so compelling. Talk a little bit more about the nuts and bolts of being a good culture carrier. What are, what are, some, of the, what are some of the hallmarks of someone who does that well? A great culture carrier is acutely aware of his or her shared values, beliefs, and behaviors with their leadership team. So 
every good every good CEO sits his or her leadership team down because this is going to cascade now into the rest of the organization, and they make the implicit explicit. This is what we value. This is this is what we this is what we believe. This is the purpose of our organization, and this is how our behavior needs to be aligned. And then they bring in their systems, rewards, compensation, performance management, to reinforce those values, beliefs, and behaviors. When you have an organization operating like that, you have some marvelously aligned people, and you have an organization where people actually want to join, want to stay, are willing to go through the really tough times which, by the way, we're, 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 you know, we're right in the middle of. And Eric, I'm sure you have encountered folks who embody that. Can you talk a little bit about what you've seen you know, in the room with the folks who do embody that culture carrier, people who do read the room well, how that plays out versus some of the other leadership models that we've seen? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. And in, um, in the vast majority of the engagements and, and um, clients that I work with or have worked with, um, you know, it's always some element of, of crisis or challenge or whatever it may be, uh, not to mention obviously the pandemic that we're in now. And, you know, it becomes pre pretty quantitative over time because you can see, you know, at the beginning of a, of a challenge and, and, and a crisis, you might have a hundred people on a team just to use an easy number. Mm -hmm. And for those using Ted's point um, where there's, a culture carrier, there's a purpose, there's a message, and it's more than just, you know, what am I going to make on the other side of this, whether it's during, you know, the pendency of the crisis or post, um, you could sort of fast forward and say, we have act Y number of people that are remaining, you know, versus in other situations where if it's done the right way and you have that culture and, and you have people who want to be there because they care about the success of the outcome of whatever the situation may be, um, there are significantly more of that sort of core team that are remaining on the other side of it. So certainly, I, I think it's, you know, it's, I don't have exact numbers because I've never actually looked at it that way, but just thinking through, you know, any number of, of, of situations in mind right now, there's absolutely a distinct difference between the people that are remaining and really pulling on the rope because they believe in it versus those that didn't have that leadership, um, there may be, you know, certainly a, a significant number of folks that may not be part of that team on a go forward basis. Well, we're, we're already over time, um, but we do have a lot of good questions. If you guys have a couple more minutes, just because we, we, we've gotten a ton of people interested in this. Um, one question that I think, I think is really interesting um, is women tend to score higher when it comes to EQ is this the time for more female leadership at the top of companies in, in general, on average? I think it's, I think it's, uh, I think it's always the time for more diverse, for more diversity. Right. So um, I, I know some of those studies and they, uh, it, I think generally I would, I would agree with the finding Um you can draw your own conclusions. We have to do a far better job of diversity and leadership than, than we've done. And, and if there's a way in which uh, gender plays a, a, an advantage in, in adopting some of these you know, competencies and skills, that's great. Um, but I, what I will say is that you know, when we study great CEOs, some of the people that I mentioned, didn't, we didn't get a chance to talk about too, too many of them, you know, Males and yeah, you know, it, it, it's it it's it runs the gamut, right? So it's it's just important to get those behaviors activated in our leaders. Um, we have uh, a number of uh, audience members here from around the world. How does the transformative leadership model across uh, apply across different cultures globally? Any changes? Anything different uh, applying in different uh, parts of the world? There's been a lot of research on this for four decades, and of course, there are there are cultural differences, but the the model plays extremely well, and I would say increasingly better in you know as as we become a more globally integrated business community. You're talking about empathy. You're talking about communication. You're talking about a compelling vision. You're talking about honor and respect and authenticity 
for people and, and towards people. It, it's, it's a, it, it plays well globally and increasingly so. And you think this will increasingly become a competitive advantage to companies and CEOs that practice it? It's already a competitive advantage in terms of where people want to work. We know that. Um, and we know from some of the outcome studies that it, it certainly positively impacts business results. Yes, I do think so, Dan. Great. And uh, Eric, talk to us a little bit about where you see this is going. We're going through a big crisis right now. How does some of the what we're talking about, um, what does it look like on the other side of this? Is this the crisis that brings this to the fore and makes people realize I need to work on this? This really is the model I want to bring into my shop? Um, or is this something where you know, we get back to a great bull run and, and the economy's great again and people can kind of feel like they can set this aside and get back to business as usual? I, I, I believe it. I, I hope that it does affect change here. And, and um, you know, like we said earlier, you know, people remember leaders in crisis. And if, if on the other side of this, you know, a particular leader has done a great job um, with understanding their employees, you know, uh, leading them through with purpose, um, creating a, a, a place where they want to be and they're valued. Um, and the same holds true for their various customers and other stakeholders. I truly believe that that is something that, particularly in a, a pandemic such as what we're in right now, um, people will remember and that will become a, a very critical part of um, those that are successful versus those that, you know, may struggle more on the other side of this. So I, I absolutely believe that it'll, it'll be remembered, important and critical. And, and I do hope that, you know, it helps affect change. That's great. And Ted, I'm going to turn to you for some final thoughts. Folks who, who like what they heard and they want to take this on and they want to improve here. Any tips for just getting going at becoming, adopting this more transformational model? Yeah, I mean, I, w I would say, you know, there's, there's certainly plenty to read about and we can send out, you know, whether that's a, a, a Sloan article or an HBR article, there's plenty of books to read. Executive coaching, um, as I said, in, can be especially effective in increasing your emotional intelligence. And I would actually look inside of your own organizations. You'd be surprised of some of the people, not just in HR, but some of the people on your staff that may have... Uh, are reading reading up on this on, on their in their spare time so we can get some resources out Dan as well after this well Ted Eric I want to thank you both so much for joining us today and sharing with us uh, that's all the time we have we thank you uh, for tuning in and we hope you found the webinar valuable and we look forward to seeing you at soon at our next event until then good luck and be good to one another thanks thank you thanks a lot thank you